today. We're here to meet with the Lord. We're here to be challenged by Him, to be changed by Him, to be comforted by Him. And I hope that you'll find this place a place that is welcoming and friendly. And we're great, and we're just so glad that you're here, especially if you're a first-time guest with us this morning. We're so grateful that you're here this morning with us. Just wanted you to look at the screen for a little bit here. Today, we are continuing in our series, You Asked For It. This is a series that is answering big questions when it comes to faith, when it comes to what we believe, and when it comes to is the Bible and God. And today, we're going to talk about one of the, the grandest topics of all time. We're talking about a topic today and a question today that should be dear to each and every one of us that are believers and so endearing to us that it changes our world on a daily basis. We're talking about a controversial question, a controversial topic. If, if for those that are non-believers that are curious about this, the question that is asked and has been asked for the last 2,000 years. One of the most debated and heated questions that's ever existed ever since the first century. And what is that question today? We're going to be talking about what's so special about Jesus. What's so special about Jesus? Is this an important question? It's an extremely important question. Not only for us to know the answer to the question, but to be able to tell other people the answer to the question. And once we truly grasp what is so amazing about Jesus and what is so special about Jesus, we can't help but think that it would invade our very mind and heart and the way in which we live and the decisions that we make and the motive for what we do in life. What is so special about Jesus? There's a quote by comedian Jimmy Carr, and he says this, if we're all God's children, what's so special about Jesus? He obviously didn't mean this in a, a great way, but more in a joking way since he's a comedian. And let me just give you a piece of advice. This is free. won't cost you anything today. Please do not build your theology on the opinions or jokes of comedians. Or on TV shows or on celebrities' opinions. Find out what the Bible says. Find out and research. Because a man who can get up and make money just because he is offensive doesn't mean that you should build your religious belief system upon something that people find humorous. And the fact that what he has to say is bad theology. And we're going to talk about that. Let's start with a question about when it comes to what's so special about Jesus. Here's a question that you'll get asked often if you have these discussions with people. And it goes like this. Is there any evidence apart from the Bible of the existence of Jesus Christ? We live in a day and time and it's been a heated debate for centuries of people saying, well, Jesus never even really existed. As a matter of fact, you and I are all here because of a legend, because of a myth, because of a person that did not even exist. And that's a common thought in our day and time. Is there any evidence apart from the Bible of the existence of Jesus Christ? Because if there is not, if, there, if Jesus didn't exist, we're going to find out this later. We're really wasting our time being here today. You could have all slept in. You could have washed your cars, mowed your grass, went to the lake, went fishing. You could have done something other than being here. So is Jesus just some made up legend? Is there any proof apart from the Bible? Now, if you weren't here for the sermons that we talked about where we answered the question, can we trust the Bible? You can look up on YouTube, uh, you can look on our Facebook account, and you can watch those. And you can see that we laid a perfect, well, I don't know if perfect, uh, as far as the delivery of it, but we laid sufficient evidence to cast down any doubt about the reliability of Scripture. 
So let us not, when I say this question, I am not discrediting the validity of the testimony of the Word of God. The Word of God stands far above as a superior witness to the answer to this question. But let's look at other evidence as well, just to build the case even better. Let's look first of all at Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, an ancient Roman historian, who wrote about things, obviously, that pertain to the history of Rome. Rome was a big city. Rome was a big deal in history and even in the foundation and the operation of how we even operate as a country in America today. We learned many things from the city of Rome. You know what got right in the forefront of the explosive growth that Rome was going to understand and partake of, Christianity did. And Tacitus writes about this when he's writing in his historical accounts about the time when Nero, Emperor Nero, kind of lost his mind, wanted to build a big house for himself, so he decided to burn down what we would call the ghetto of Rome in that day. He didn't want the undesirable people, and he wanted to make room for his big mansion he was going to build himself, so he decided to set fire to it. Well, as you can imagine, the citizens of Rome, when they found out about this, they didn't like it. And so what Nero did was he thought, I'll find a scapegoat. There's a group that he chose to use as his scapegoat, and this was it. This is what Tacitus wrote. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated by, for their abominations, called what? Christians. By the populace. Christus, which is the Latin word for Christ, from whom the name had its origin, look what he says, suffered the extreme penalty. This was a common phrase known to the Romans. When he said the extreme penalty, he knew that they knew that he was talking about crucifixion. During the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate and a most mischievous superstition, the idea that they believed in the resurrection of Jesus, Thus checked for the moment, again, broke out not only in Judea, but the first, source, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Tacitus is writing about the evidence that there is people in Rome during his time who is following a man named Christ, Jesus Christ. Showing the evidence in a very uh, close, uh, in, in the era of time in which Jesus Christ had lived and died. We're talking first century history that shows proof of the mention of Christians in Jesus Christ. Let's look at Pliny, uh, Pliny the Younger. He was a Roman governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor. He was writing a letter and he was seeking advice on how to handle Christians. Christianity was not always legal in a lot of places in the world. It's not legal today. It wasn't legal in Rome. And, he, and yet there were so many Christians he was seeking advice on how to handle them. This is what he wrote. They... Uh, speaking of Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day. Sounds kind of like us today, right? The early church, the history of the church shows that the majority of the history of the church, the church met on Sunday, the first day of the week. That's not just something we do because we do it. We do it because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. So every time we meet here on a Sunday, we proclaim to the world, we are serving and worshiping a God who is alive. Right? Look what it says. On a day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to who? Christ. As to a God. And what that means is they were singing songs of worship and adoration to a man named Jesus as if he was God. That's what he's saying. As to God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. After which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food. He's talking about uh, communion or what's known as the Lord's Supper. But food of an ordinary and innocent kind. This was written to the Emperor Trajan in A.D. 112. Not very far away from the time in A.D. 30, around A.D. 30 to 33, when Jesus died and rose again. This is strong historical evidence. Here's another one, and this is a great uh, source to go to. His name was Flavius Josephus. He was a first century Jewish historian. He, he, he took down history of Israel, and he was even there, especially in A.D. 70, when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome. Here's what he had. He was not a believer. Now, what's important about that? 
He was not a believer, and he still recorded history of the existence and evidence of Jesus Christ. This was not biased on his part, but he wrote history as it was. He wrote a description of the condemnation of one James, as in the apostle, as in, the, uh, as in James that we read about in Scripture, by the Jewish San Sanhedrin. This James, says Josephus, was the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ. We have historical, and this is just a few that I've showed you of historical documentation of the existence of Jesus. And you may sit there and say, well, this doesn't prove Jesus was God. No, we're talking about right now that the evidence that Jesus Christ, the person, existed. You can know with a sufficient amount of evidence that when we talk about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that real person existed on this planet. And now we have to start there and build a case. Is was Jesus just a man? Let me give you one more piece of advice as far as archaeology goes. This is an ancient ossuary. If you don't know what that, was, that is, it's a little box that once a person was buried and all of the flesh of the body and the meat deteriorated, they would collect the bones and they would put them in this box. It saved space. Sometimes they wouldn't have their own tomb. Uh, you know, that was very common back then. This was a, this was a practice that was practiced uh, up until about A.D. 70, um, just for a, a period of maybe 60 to 100 years, somewhere around there. So it's very, uh, very definite to remember the dating time of this practice. And I want you to get this because this, is a, this was an interesting find. I actually had, was blessed to go to Israel. You've heard me talk about it before. I got to go under the city of Jerusalem and they had this very thing. I got to see it with my own eyes sitting in a box on display. Now what's important about this ossuary? You really can't see it in this picture, but underneath it, amongst all the divots on the side of it, underneath the words ancient ossuary, about maybe two inches below that, there's an inscription that is, that is um, in that ossuary, the side of that ossuary. This was a very common practice. I'm going to show it to you here in just a second up close. It's a very common practice. Basically, it's kind of like labeling it. This is who this belongs to. This is who this ossuary belongs to, or this is whose bones are inside of it. If you look up close, you may be able to see it in the stone, a little bit closer, etched into the side of it. And then this is a, a, a lithograph of it showing you kind of the image of it. This is written in Arabic. And when you read something in Arabic, it's different from uh, English. You have to read it opposite from right to left. This is what it says on the side of this ossuary. If you look at it this way, you may be able to see it. The first word it shows on the left is Jesus. The second two words is brother of, and then Joseph, and then son of James. Now we read that, Jesus, brother, Joseph, son of James. That doesn't sound right. But remember, we have to read it opposite. James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Now, let me point this out before I clarify what this is talking about. Is there an exorbitant amount of literature in ancient day written about Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Biblical, extra biblical evidence. No, there's not a, 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 a huge amount. And the reason why is this. We think of Jesus 2,000 years later. This is the guy who changed the world, right? If you were living in Rome in the day and time in which Jesus was living, he was a nobody. They wouldn't have been writing about him. They'd be writing about kings and Caesars and emperors and all of you. Jesus was just a carpenter from Nazareth who the majority of the country, uh, of the nation, despised him because once he finally started his three to three to six year long ministry, probably more like three year public ministry. He started gaining popularity. They really didn't like him because he claimed to be Messiah. So I want you to understand that. So when you see something like this, it was very common in that day and time to find an ossuary or something along the like that would say James, son of Joseph. Last names weren't very common or existent at all back then. So you were known by different things. Peter of Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, what town, or James, son of Joseph. These were very common names back then, too. We don't have a lot of people today running around named Jesus. But back then, there was some that were named Yeshua, which is Jesus in their language, which was very close to Joseph in a lot of ways. 
So the idea here is what makes this find so significant is, yeah, it said James, brother of Joseph, but you would never find one that ascribed who their brother was. You would never find that. There's no reason for it. You would not, you, they would not label themselves as I'm James, brother of Bartholomew. It was known rather I am James, son of Joseph. Or Andrew, son of Zebedee, or, or whatever the case may be, so people would make that connection. But why does it not only just say the name of his father, but also his brother? Because his brother was Jesus. That's why. And that was a common knowledge, and it, that was something that meant, you can imagine being the brother of Jesus, would that mean something to you? Yeah. This is a strong finding for the evidence, another finding of the evidence of Jesus Christ. Now let's move on here and, and look at another statement. We looked at extra biblical, all, the, all that we're going to look at today, of the existence of Jesus. Let's move on and let's answer some other questions that skeptics may ask or people who are interested are asking questions. They may say something like this. Jesus never claimed to be God. Why should you make that claim if he did not? Now, this is a statement made usually just based on presuppositions or hearsay. Someone heard someone say it. Someone heard somebody say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Because a person who will hear this question and do the research in the Word has no justification for agreeing with this. None whatsoever, and I want to show you that. And after all, if Jesus didn't claim to be God, we're wasting our time here. He was just a, a, a leader. He was just some motivational speaker. He was just someone who showed care and compassion. But that's it. Did Jesus claim to be God? Yes, he did. And I want to point out, too, that he's the only religious leader that did so. Muhammad has never claimed to be God. Buddha has never claimed to be God. There's one that stands unique in a classification all his own, and that is Jesus Christ. He claimed to be God. Show us, okay? John chapter 8, verse 58 through 59. Jesus said to them, I assure you before Abraham was, I am. At that, they picked up stones to throw at him. This is in the midst of a conversation going on with the religious leaders of the day. And Jesus makes this statement. And all of a sudden, these religious moral leaders pick up stones and they're ready to kill Jesus. Why? Just because he said, I assure you before Abraham was, I am. They even asked him, you're not even 50 years old. How could you say before Abraham was you were? He has another conversation about how Abraham saw him. He said, you're crazy. But then he makes this statement, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. They pick up stones and they're ready to kill him. Let me ask you a question to be thinking about. Why would they pick up stones and ready to kill him just for making that statement? Let's move on in, in John chapter 8, verse 24. Look what he says. And I want you to be thinking about this. For if you, this is Jesus speaking, if you do not believe that I am, and in our modern English translations it will say that I am he, you will die in your sins. The thing is, in the Greek text, the word he is not there. And it gives a great emphasis of what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is literally saying here is, for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, if you look back at the last one, it's, I have the, word I, the words I am underlined. If you look at what I just read, you see the words I am. Let's, let's move on to John chapter 10 as we're thinking about this. Then the Jews surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. It can't get any more of a great question than that. These men ask him, If you're Messiah, just tell us. Look what Jesus says. I have been telling you. I did tell you. And you don't believe. Jesus answered them. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And look what he says next. The Father and I are one. And what do they do? Again, they pick up rocks ready to stone him. Look what Jesus says to him. 
I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these works are you stoning me for? Look at their answer. We aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answered. But for what? Blasphemy. Why? Because you, being a man, do what? Make yourself God. If we go back to what I read first when he says, Hey, I assure you before Abraham was, I am. When we go back and he says, If you don't believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. You see, there was, a, there was a two words that meant a lot to the Jewish people. Those two words were, I am. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Do you remember the story of Moses and the burning bush? Moses is going, he sees a burning bush, it's not consumed by fire, and it starts talking to him. You probably have a bad day too that day, right? He walks up and God says, hey, Moses, uh, you grew up in Egypt for a while, and then you made a mistake, or you killed someone, you ran away, you've been hiding for 40 years, but I'm going to send you back, and you're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And then Moses gives all these excuses why he can't do it, and then he finally says, okay, I'll do it. And he says, hey, when I go, who should I tell him sent me? What was the answer from the bush? I am. God speaking through it. This was the identifying label of Jehovah, of God. And what Jesus was doing was he was repeatedly selling these Jewish people, I am, I am. He was saying he was God. And that's what they said. We're going to kill you because you're saying you are God. So don't ever believe that Jesus never claimed to be God. He claimed it many times, even saying, I and the Father are one. Jesus claimed to be God. So let me ask, that. here's another question that we have to get to. And let me, let me say this before we talk about this question. This is in our day and time. I would say perhaps more than any other time in history. This next question is it vital for us to really think about it. Because this is one, this is one that is emerging on the scene and has been emerging as a very powerful question for those that are seeking answers. And it is this one. Which Jesus? Which Jesus? And you think, what are you talking about? Is there more than one Jesus? Is there? Biblically, we would say no. But how does that answer play out in us? Right? Which Jesus? That's what the skeptics are focusing on now. You have this group over here saying this kind of Jesus. You have this group over here saying Jesus is a Republican. You have this group over here saying Jesus is a Democrat or a Libertarian. Or Jesus is liberal and Jesus is conservative. Since we're in the political season, I'll go ahead and step off into that. Right? Let me clear that up. Jesus is not a Democrat. Jesus is not a Republican. Jesus is not a liber Libertarian. Jesus is God. Amen. He's God. He's God. Does that play out in politics for us as believers? Yes, it should in a way. It should. But listen to this. No matter what you read on Facebook or how many debates you watch, after November, come November 9th, Jesus will still be God. And he won't be surprised by anything that happens on election day. And he's not going to all of a sudden go, oh, what are we going to do now? He's not. The government sits on his shoulders, not the other way around. He will raise up nations and he will tear nations down and it will be for his glory and his honor. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be beneficial citizens of whatever society we live in. But what it does mean is our fear and our faith should never be in the political system of our country. Our faith is on Jesus Christ. Which Jesus? You know, there's a lot of people that we can look up to throughout history. One of my favorite presidents of all time is Abraham Lincoln. I like to read about him. I think of the toughest time that's ever existed in our history, the Civil War, a man who was able to come and be able to bring a nation together after the most deadliest war our nation's ever seen. Do you know what? Abraham Lincoln doesn't compare in the light of Jesus. Right? 
You think of leaders throughout time where we read their quotes. And I mean, you read people from like George Washington and Thomas Edison. And you read Andrew Jackson. And you read people like even Martin Luther King Jr. And you read all of these great people throughout time who penned things that made us think and give us wisdom. All of them compare to nothing at the feet of Jesus. Listen, we can be motivated by human leaders. We can be motivated by people who bring truth. We can be motivated by them, but do not build your identity upon them. As believers, build your identity on Jesus Christ. Because it is crucial in our day and time that people don't first see you as a Republican or a Democrat. That they don't first see you as a conservative or a liberal. That they don't first see you as a follower of this person or that person. It is crucial that people get a glimpse of the authentic and beautiful Jesus that's found in the Bible through your life. That's going to be crucial. It's going to be crucial in the decisions you make, in the life you live, in the eyes that are watching, in the ears that are hearing what comes out of your mouth. When they look at your priorities, when they look at your Facebook post, when they even if they could look at your bank account and they look at those things and they say, which Jesus do you ascribe to? You saw several pictures that we showed at the beginning when you looked at that screen. Every single one of them depicting throughout time or throughout some philosophical mindset of who they think Jesus is. Here's the danger. You have no right, and I have no right to make Jesus anything other than who he is. You see, Jesus doesn't fit in my pocket and just fit my mode of thought. My mode of thought should not be reigning over Jesus. My mode of thought and operation of life should conform to Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? So when I ask the question, which Jesus are you clinging to? Is he the convenient Jesus? Is he the all-loving, no-just Jesus? Is he the all-just, no-loving Jesus? Is he the convenient Jesus? That's an important question. Jesus only means something to me when his teachings are convenient in my life. This is an important question. Which Jesus? I want to tell you which Jesus. It's the Jesus found in the Bible. He's not politically correct, but he's personally sensitive. He's not compromising at all, but he is compassionate. He is love and he is just. And you can't divide him. Let's look what Jesus says. Jesus said, I am. There's those words again, aren't they? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you're here today and you're Confused about what Jesus is saying here? He's saying this. And I want you to get this. But I want you to get in the spirit of love. He's saying, listen. Buddha is not the way. Allah is not the way. Muhammad is not the way. Hum humanity is not the way. Good works is not the way. Baptism is not the way. Perfect church attendance is not the way. Always paying your taxes on time is not the way. Obeying your parents is not the way. Being faithful to your spouse is not the way. Are all those good things to a point? Yes, they are. But if you're counting on your behavior and your ability to get you to heaven, you're going to, one breath after death, you're going to be very disappointed. You see, Jesus is not pulling the punches. He's not saying, I'm a way. Good luck finding out which one it is. He's saying, I am the way. He's painting a very clear roadmap on how you can know the creator of all things and how you can know God the Father. And if you don't go through Jesus, you will not know him. This is the Jesus that we proclaim at this church. 
This is the Jesus that should be proclaimed in your life. Let's go on here. You want to know which Jesus that we should follow? It's this Jesus found in Hebrews chapter 4. And this sets him apart from every single religious leader or religious system there is. It says this, Therefore, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to the confession. That Jesus is the Son of God. Look what else it says. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, because he's a high priest who's been through everything we've been through, and yet he did not sin, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the proper time. This is what makes Jesus holy and unique. Because you go search out any other religion and you will not find a God who can sympathize with you. Who loves you and openly and welcomes you into his throne. And did it without ever sinning. You won't find a God like that. There is none. There are plenty of gods who say you do this and you and, and you don't do this and you punish people and you do all these things. And then just maybe, just maybe if the scales tip in your balance, you'll be good. That's what every man-made religion outside of Christianity teaches and preaches. No matter what they say, if you get down to the nuts and bolts of their religion. It is one day you'll be judged on the good and the bad. And if your good, according to that God, outweighs the bad, you will get to go to heaven or nirvana or whatever it is. Only Jesus says you could never be good enough. Never. The thing is you don't have to because Jesus lived a perfect life. He went through everything that you'll experience in this life. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be tired, to be afraid. He knows what it's like to have every single person that's close to him betray him and turn their back on him and abandon him. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to have and to have not. He came and he lived among us and he lived our life and he lived a perfect life and with all innocence, he laid down his life and he rose again so that we can know him. There is no other God that you will find like Jesus because he's the only one. In Matthew chapter 11, look what his invitation is. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. You know, he's talking about being weary and burdened because of trying to live up to a religion. He's speaking to a, a religious society. He's saying, you're trying to keep this religion and it's wearing you down. You can't do it. Just come to me. Look what he says. And I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for yourselves for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Jesus that we are to follow. Let me tell you something. If we can't get excited about Jesus, we need to have a talk. Because everything that we believe here today, if we're believers, everything that we as Christians hold to, it rises and falls on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand this. We need to fall in love with Him. And realize who he is. Philippians chapter 2. Look at this. says, Make your own attitude. This is the Jesus of the Bible. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Who existing in the form of God. Who was God. Did not consider himself. Or uh, did not consider equality with God. As something to be used for his own advantage. What's he saying there? He was equal with God. But when he came to earth. He did not consider that equality. As something that he could build his own kingdom right then and there. And take from people as spoils of war. He could have, couldn't he? He was God. He could have. He even said it when he was going to the cross and they were trying to defend him. He said, don't you know that there are legions of angels waiting and all I have to do is one word and they will come and rescue me and destroy them. And he didn't even need them to do it. 
quality with God is something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And look at this. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the Jesus of the Bible. In other words, Jesus is not your back pocket buddy. Where you just pull him out when you need him. Jesus is God. And if you're one of his followers, he's the boss. And the reason why is because he died for you. And he rose again. And one day, I don't know where you are in your spiritual life, but one day, the Bible tells us, one day every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want to beg you today, don't wait till that day to do it. Listen to me. Today you have a decision on whether or not you'll confess Jesus is Lord. This is the Jesus of the Bible. You see, he's, a, he's the one true living God. He came one time as a baby in a manger and he lived a perfect life and he died for us. But I want to let you know the next time we see Jesus, he won't be coming to die. He'll be coming to rule and to reign and to live forever with those who followed him. You need to know that Jesus. He's not a passive, passive Jesus. And he's not an aggressive Jesus. He's in control of all things. And his will would be done to the glory of God the Father. You need to know this Jesus. And the Bible paints a great picture of who Jesus is. And by the way, let me ask you this. The reason why which Jesus comes up that question is because there are so many groups of people out there who are claimed to be Christ followers who believe different things about him. Yes, there's different denominations of Christianity, Right? They're all out there. And people look at that and say, look, your followers can't even get along. Hey, and Jesus in John 17, he prayed that all of his followers would come together so that the world could see that he's the son of God. But let me tell you this. As there, it is true that there are different beliefs about different things throughout the broad uh, canopy of churches today. I want you to know this, that every Christian church fully and wholeheartedly agrees on one thing for sure. And that is Jesus Christ as God. They also agree that he died, and they also agree he rose again. And let me tell you something. Out of all of Christianity, that's the most important thing you can know. Amen. And we all agree on that. There's differences that start right after that, but those are the similarities. And those are the most important. You know the Jesus that I believe in and the one that the Bible teaches? He's the one that is risen. What's so special about Jesus? It's kind of an if-then thing. If Jesus is who he claimed to be, then he is special, right? Because look, there is no other God known to man who died and rose again. But Jesus did. He is risen. That's what sets him apart. Why should I devote my whole life to him? Because he's alive and well today. Why does that matter? Because he gives us hope. Because guess what? Every single one of us in this room We'll see death one day. And the only hope we have after death is the fact that there is a risen Savior today who defeated death, defeated our worst enemy. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This, the fact that he rose again is everything to us as believers. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sin. If Jesus is still dead today, we're a bunch of fools. Isn't that what the world says? Well, you're fools for believing in a God you can't see and all these other things. And we piled up this evidence and we're not very far into this series at all. Listen to me today. We have piled this evidence. But I want to tell you, and I want you to think about this. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, does that make him special? Does it make him God? Yes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it tells us that after he rose again, he was seen by 500 people. 
We'll talk a little bit more about this next week as well. 500 people saw the risen Savior. Not only that, his tomb was empty. We take that for granted, and there's been a lot of people trying to discredit that with different theories, such as the swoon theory and things like that. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But I want you to understand that that ragtag church, that little church back then that was scared to death in a room, shaking, hiding, thinking they're fixing to kick in our door and they're fixing to crucify us as well. Peter, who denied Jesus three times and even called a curse down upon him so he wouldn't be arrested. All of them in the Garden of Gethsemane, when they realized Jesus wasn't going to put up a fight, they left him there. They ran for their lives. That little church that was in dismay, three day, or eight days later, Jesus showed up in a room. He had already risen again. He showed himself to some women on that third day after he had died and rose again. They went back and told the apostles as they were hiding and they were like, what is that? How can this be? They even ran and they saw the empty tomb, but they're not sure. And eight days later, while they're in a room, guess who showed up? Jesus did. And you know what happens about 50 days later? Peter stands up at one of the biggest feasts of Jerusalem where thousands of people come. He's standing. This dude is not denying Jesus anymore. He stands in front of thousands of people and he makes this statement. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, you all murdered him. Does that sound like a coward? You see, what happened? That little scaredy cat church, they saw a risen Savior. They saw a Jesus who was no longer. They were at the cross. They, they knew he was dead. No matter what theory he was, Rome, Roman soldiers were perfectionists at the art of death. And all of a sudden, eight days later, Jesus is standing in a room with them. They had an experience with Jesus they would not forget. And every one of those apostles lived and died horrible deaths because they saw a risen Savior. Have you seen the risen Savior today? And I'm not talking... Something weird where Jesus showed up at the foot of your bed while you were dreaming. I'm talking about, have you had a face-to-face -face meeting in your heart with the risen Savior? This is what's so special about Jesus. He died. He was in the grave for three days. And he rose again. Let me tell you something. And I've heard skeptics say this. Well, hey, you know what? The other day I was out... I've been hiking in the mountain and I fell off the side of the cliff and I died and I was there three days and I rose again. Why don't you come follow me? Well, the problem was that you were the only one on the mountain and because of your mistake, you fell off the mountain. That's a whole different story than 500 people seeing someone that they saw brutally die at the hands of someone else. And 500 people saw him living and breathing 50 days later. Right? That's a big difference. Jesus is special. Here's something else that we have to understand about him. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people. And we must be saved by it. If you're counting on anything else, you're standing on sinking sand. The name of Jesus because he's risen. He is the only one. Every, just about every religion speaks highly of Jesus Christ. But only the Bible presents him as God. And gives sufficient evidence for it. And like I said, other people have had things to say about Jesus. And I want to share a few quotes with you that I thought was really good. What others have said about Jesus. No one else holds or has held the place in the heart of the world which Jesus holds. Other gods have been as devoutly worshipped. No other man has been so devoutly loved. Look at this next one by Mahatma Gandhi. 
A man who was completely innocent offered himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, and became the ransom of the world. It was a perfect act. No other God has done this. Here's a long one by a, a great historian named Philip Schaff. I want you to read this as long because it's really powerful. So, so stay with it and read it. Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander the Great, Caesar, Muhammad, and Napoleon. Without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of school, he spoke such words as, of life as were never spoken before or since. And he produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more sermons, orations, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. No one has impacted the existence of humanity in, in history and in present than Jesus Christ. H.G. Wells says this, I am a historian. I am not a believer. But I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. Here's an unknown quote. Socrates, great philosopher in his time, taught for 40 years. Plato for 50. Aristotle for 40. And Jesus for only three. Yet the influence of Christ's three-year ministry infinitely transcends the impact left by the combined 130 years of teaching from these men who were among the greatest philosophers of all antiquity. You see, there's credibility and there's validity to the idea of who Jesus is. Albert Einstein says, as a child, I received instruction both in the Bible and in the Talmud. I'm a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth, listen to this, no myth is filled with such life. How many of you would be willing to die for a lie? That you knew was a lie. And someone held you up and began to beat you and torture you to deny this lie that you know is a lie. How many of you would die for a lie? And every one of those apostles died horrible deaths. The only one that survived his punishment was the apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. You know what happened to him? They boiled him in oil and he lived over it. And because they already carried out the punishment, they could not get, give the same punishment again. So they, they uh, banished him to a little island called the Isle of Patmos. And he had to live there. There's a 90-year-old man who had been boiled alive. And on that island, Jesus showed up and, and the Holy Spirit inspired him in the book of Revelation. Peter was crucified upside down. The apostle Paul was beheaded. You go on and on down the line. Horrible, terrible deaths. Don't think that these men were insane. If they knew Jesus died and didn't rise again, there's no way. Logically speaking, they would go through that. But why did they? Because they saw a risen Savior. And they realized that death is not the end. They had confidence in Him. So let me end by asking you this question. What will you say about Jesus? We've told you what the Bible says. We've answered the question, why is Jesus so special? But listen, for you personally, if you leave it at that, it will do you no good. You have to answer this question next. What will you say about Jesus? This was a question that was given to those same men I just told you about that were boiled alive and crucified upside down. Let's read the passage in Mark chapter 8. Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They answered him, John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. Still others, one of the prophets. But you, Jesus asked them, who do you say that? I want you to understand, while you're sitting here today, we're giving a lot of this evidence, but here's the whole reason for it. 
Jesus today is looking at your heart and He's asking you, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And I hope that your answer would be like Peter when he says, you are the Son of God, the Messiah. Amen. But with those words, as they come out of your mouth and heart at the same time, that bears a responsibility on us, doesn't it? That if He truly is the one who created us, if He truly is the one who laid down His life for us, all of us as sinners, if He truly is the one who rose again, then He should be God. Not just in reality, in principle, in theory, but He should be God personally in your life. Which means this, I take the reins of my life and I give them to Him. You see, that's why people ask, which Jesus? You know, one of the biggest questions that skeptics have is, if Jesus is so great, why is his people so horrible? Let's take our bow and shame. Amen? Are you with me? Because we've done a horrible job many times. If we're going to claim the name of Jesus, let's live the way Jesus wants us to live. Where are you at today in your life? Let me go back to this quote by Jimmy Carr. If we're all God's children, what's so special about Jesus? How about we let the Bible answer his question? The answer is found in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He, Jesus, came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. But look at this next phrase. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in His name. What's He saying? We're not all God's children. And what makes Jesus so special is He's the one that makes us God's children. So Jimmy Carr, go back to telling jokes. And leave Jesus alone. Because He's special. And my heart's desire is in my life. I, I, I can't speak for you but as I look at this message and I hear these words coming out of my mouth, I'm convicted to the very core that Jesus said, I have not made Jesus as special as he should be in my life. Are people seeing more of Jeff than they're seeing Jesus? And I have to say they probably are. And what a shame. Because there's not much to look at when it comes to looking at Jeff. But there's a whole lot to look at when it comes to looking at Jesus. Amen? So will people see Jesus in you? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, who do you say Jesus is? Look at me real quick. That's the most important answer you could ever give to a question. Who do you say Jesus is? Have you given your life to him? The Jesus of the Bible is the greatest being that humanity has ever known. Because he is God. One more quote. Peter Larson said this, and I want you to get this. Despite our efforts to keep him out, God intrudes. The life of Jesus is bracketed by two impossibilities. A virgin's womb and an empty tomb. Jesus entered our world through a door marked no entrance and left through a door marked no exit. You want to know what makes Jesus special? It's this. An empty cross and an empty tomb. And no one else can compare. As we stand, if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, listen real quick. If you're a follower of Jesus, the question which Jesus exists, you need to answer it and then we need to all do this. Show them Jesus. If you're here today, and you don't know Jesus, I want you to hear this. You can leave today knowing the one you didn't know when you showed up. And all it takes is you understanding what we've said about Jesus. The evidence for it that leads you to the faith for it. And you can place your faith in Jesus Christ right where you stand. And if you do, we want to celebrate with you. We want to know you because guess what? You enter a, a huge family when you do that. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, there's a card beside you. You can fill it out. You can check one of those boxes. I will call you this week. I'll set up a time, whatever I have to do, to talk with you about knowing Jesus more. 
But you can know him right here today. You can place your faith in him where you sit. If you hear and you say you know Jesus, are you showing people Jesus? Are you living your life the way Jesus said to live? How, how do we do that? I want to encourage all of you to start reading the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you'll see how Jesus lived. And then start living your life that way. Through his strength and his power. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Our band's going to come up and they're going to lead us through a song. This is a time for you to respond to what you've heard today. To make a decision about what are you going to do about Jesus? If you've already believed in him, are you going to live for him? Or are you going to live for yourself? If you don't know him, will you come to know him today? Listen, out of all the things we can talk about, this is the greatest, Jesus Christ. Join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ.